Hello everyone and welcome to Creative Connections. My name is Frances and I'm your host for today's session and it's with great pleasure that I introduce you to Mish Grigger and Lara Toms who make up two of the three co-directors at APIDS. But first, I would like to begin acknowledging the traditional owners of the many countries throughout Australia and from where you are all joining us from today. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the lands and waters upon which I am lucky enough to work, play and live here in Sydney. I pay my deep respects to their elders, past, present and future and encourage you all to share in the chat where you are joining us from today. Currently on slide is a blue PowerPoint slide with a gold semicircle in the top right hand corner. There is some gold text that says introduction and connect, adapt, respond beneath in white text. Under that, there are three themes that our webinar series covers. Leadership adaptation, digital adaptation and arts practice adaptation. Today's session with APHIDS will focus largely on arts practice adaptation and rethinking how we collaborate during these times. As you now all know, these sessions run um, every Wednesday and Friday and are free. Oops, sorry, also on screen are four video boxes with our guest speakers, Ozan Interpreter and myself. I'm your host for today's session. I'm a woman in my early 30s with fair skin, wavy brown hair, blue eyes, and a black and white polka dot dress. In the background, there are some plants, uh, colorful artworks on the wall and uh, my couch and again still sleeping puppy on the couch behind me. <laughs> we hope that you have found these series to be useful and that you are able to join the sessions that you feel are relevant to you and offer some support to you during this time of intense change and uncertainty. Before we begin, I wanted to remind everyone that the 2020 Resilience Fund applications will close at the end of this month on the 28th of May. This is to create space uh, and time to establish the next phase of Council's direct investment in programs and opportunities for artists and organisations. Look out for more details around this in the second half of June. I also wanted to draw your attention to the programs and resources section on our website, which gathers together all of the current resources available to you, including webinars, podcasts, research and more. The Intel podcast series launches a new episode every Thursday at 5 p.m. And tomorrow's podcast will be with Elena Knox, a Tokyo-based artist who in recent years has sustained her creative practice by traveling and exhibiting internationally. But of course, where to from here? So please listen to that tomorrow evening. Please also visit www.australiacouncil.gov.au forward slash programs dash and dash resources for more information on all of these resources available. I know that many of you now have attended some of these webinars, so we'll be, uh, I'll keep the housekeeping quick. Live captioning is available via Zoom and be, can be toggled on or off using the CC button below. You can also view captions via stream text in a pop-out browser if you'd prefer. Please also use the chat feature to engage with each other throughout the session and share your thoughts and ideas with the speakers as they come to mind. Uh, similarly, if you have a question, please send this through via the Q&A button at the bottom rather than posting it in the chat so it doesn't get lost. We'll aim to get through as many questions as we can by the end of the session today. If you require any tech help, please just use the raise hand feature or let us know in the chat and Laura or Kevin from our team will be on hand to support. And finally, a recording of today's session will be available after the webinar around mid next week. Uh, along with any PowerPoints, resources or links from today's session as well. There'll also be a short survey to complete for us to sort of continue learning and improving this series for you. So please take five minutes to complete that. So now on screen is a Navy PowerPoint slide to introduce our wonderful guests, Mish and Lara. There is some text and two photos in square format and in color. At the top is Mish, a fair-skinned person smiling at the camera with shoulder-length brown hair wearing a cap with the word furious written on it in front of a yellow background. At the bottom uh, to the right is Lara, a fair-skinned person with bleached cropped hair uh, and wearing a brown coat with white t-shirt in front of a light-coloured background. 
Mission Lara, like I said before, make up two of the three co-directors at AFIDS, an artist-led experimental organisation based in Melbourne. They describe themselves as collaborative and future focused, and today will be challenging us to think about the reality of collaboration as we head into a different way of working. They'll talk to us about why it's important to rely on each other during these times. While collaboration may feel like a natural thing for many of us and something that we're drawn to as artists and practitioners, Mission Lara will remind us to check in with how we go up about setting up the collaborations properly. Creating urgent art for urgent times is AFID's focus. And it is with great pleasure that I now hand over to Mish and Lara to share some slides with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Mish, you're on mute. Hi guys, thanks so much for being here. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to get to speak to you in these quiet and lonely times. <laughs> Hello, I'm off mute now. <laughs> My name is Mish. Um, uh, as Francis said, I have pale skin, blue eyes and shoulder length brown messy hair. Uh, what you can't see on screen though is that I'm wearing my tracksuit pants just out of shot. Uh, and I'm Lara. I have uh, pale skin, blue eyes, uh, brown hair in a mullet style, a black shirt with um, red pattern on it. I'm in a white room with um, some children's toys in the background and what you can't see is that I am wearing my Ugg boots. Uh, Lara and I both live and work on Wurundjeri land, what was a sparsely wooded forest with native grassland in the northern suburbs of the city now known as Melbourne. We acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We'd like to thank OZCO for hosting these Creative Connections webinars and for inviting us to speak and also thank our Auslan interpreters for the work that they're doing today. So, collaboration, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, we've gone to our first slide, which is a picture of myself and Lara with our third co-director, Eugenia. We're standing in um, a, against a yellow wall with bright blue and red clothes on by accident. So why would we in the arts expose ourselves to the complicated and potentially dangerous process of inviting other people into our thinking, making and doing art? We've changed slides now. We've gone to uh, a list of text of what we're going to talk about today and then a group shot of the creative team of AFIDS's uh, show at the end of last year called Exit Strategies. There's a whole bunch of people standing on the set. Uh, Sartre or sort of famously said, hell is other people, and he's right. <laughs> and as Meryl Streep taught us in the movie, it's complicated, it's complicated to work with people. So how do we make sure that we're working with people, the ways that we're working with people reflect our values, our aims and our politics? How do we seek our alternative structures for working with people? Well, strap yourselves in because that's what AFIDs as directors have been thinking about for the past 15 months. Um, we've been thinking and rethinking how we work together and how we work with people. So today we're going to think through how, to, how we work with others in three stages. First, we'll talk about who we are and how we work within the company, our collaborations with each other as co-directors, as artists, as women, so how we've been thinking and doing things. Then we'll consider how that ripples out how we take these thoughts into actions with our collaborators. And finally, we'll spend a moment considering the bigger picture outside the company. We're always thinking through our place in the landscape of art makers and considering what possibilities for affecting change we might have. Um, it's really important, we think, of course, to acknowledge the uh, uh, global pandemic that we're all in. It's a kind of in-between situation and it's really stressful for different people in different ways. So we're all in between worlds, in between projects. Many of us are in between jobs. Um, I'm hoping that we're in between late capitalism and a new way of living. <laughs> but um, because we're still figuring out what this is, we're not gonna come at you with any solutions for how to operate within COVID-19 reality. We're just gonna talk about the ways that we operate in any reality and see if they, you might see if they can be applied to you, by you, to this situation. Um, yeah, so like that Meryl Streep movie, it is complicated. 
Now, we'll go to our next slide. Um, we've recently been revisiting the work of cultural theorist and philosopher Mark Fisher, and this is because we're hoping that a silver lining of this global pandemic, as I said, is the overthrowing of neoliberal capitalism, but that's another webinar. We've been reminded of his and others' ideas around solidarity and plasticity. So I'm going to read um, the quote that Mark Fisher has in his essay, um, how to Kill a Zombie, Strategizing the End of Neoliberalism, and this quote is what's on the slide. The old solidarity that neoliberalism decomposed has gone, never to return. But this does not mean that we're consigned to atomized individualism. Our challenge now is to reinvent solidarity. And he, then he describes uh, plasticity. This is the bit that's on the slide. Plasticity is not the same as elasticity. Elasticity is equivalent to the flexibility which neoliberalism demands of us, in which we assume a form imposed from the outside. But plasticity is something else. It implies both adaptability and resilience, a capacity for modification, which also retains a memory of previous encounters. These concepts, when we revisited them, really stood out to us. Adaptability, resilience, modification while retaining memory of past encounters. And we realize that this idea, plasticity, is embedded in how AFIDS considers collaboration. So we thought it would be important to talk about AFIDS as a company because we actually um, have inherited a company that has 26 years of collaborating and being artist led. And I, I think that's pretty rare in the arts landscape. I can't think of another company that can use collaborative and artist led for that long. Um, so we are a trio of co-artistic directors and CEOs. Um, that means that we have to have a methodology around making decisions for the company, um, strategic directions, artistic programs, buying cheese for the board meetings. There's no single leader or vision in our company. And then we're also artists. So we collaborate on artistic projects together. And that also means we need an artistic methodology for making decisions. Um, whether that be the form that we use for our next project or the colour of the shoes we're performing in. Um, so we only came into this position um, over a, just over a year ago. We're all women in our mid to late 30s. Um, there's myself and I come from a history of lots of collectives and collaborating and my own practice making socially engaged work, often with people beyond the arts and um, often in public spaces. Uh, Eugenia Lim, who's not with us today, she's um, also worked in a number of different collectives and um, has more of a solo practice in live and screen-based performance in the visual arts context. And then um, good old Mish has a history in her own collectives, including a trio of women called Post, and they are um, mostly in theatres. So Eugenia, Mish and myself had never worked on a creative project together before taking this role. So AFIDS actually um, began a full 26 years ago um, by a composer called David Young, a writer called Cynthia Troop, a visual artist called Sarah Peary and a fashion designer called Kath Banger. And these guys made a whole lot of sound works and site specific projects and really, you know, cemented this idea of experimentation. This model evolved into David taking on more of the artistic director role and the others supporting him. In 2010, Willow S. Whalen joined the company as the artistic director uh, and Tia Bauman was there as the executive producer. A couple of years later, Willow introduced four artistic associates into AFIDS. That was Tristan Meacham, myself, Martin Coots and Liz Dunn. So I've actually been with the company for several years in that role. This was an interesting model in itself. It, um, it, was, it was also very collaborative um, because the artistic associates didn't just come up with projects. We also weighed in on company management and strategic thinking. Um, so here was a company that was structurally top down with like an AD and a CEO um, that is more sort of secure and responsible, but also um, including these artistic associates in a collaborative and transparent way. Um, and like all company models, this had its strengths and its weaknesses. 
Then in 2008, Willow began a conversation with us and we talked about how we might like to change the company structure to run it collaboratively. And then the three of us, um, sort of late 2018, early 2019, created a anti-hierarchical model with a feminist methodology. So we come at this aware that um, power and leadership comes in many visible and invisible forms and it's a constant um, state of learning for us. It is an experiment in leadership. Um, we already came with a shared philosophy of being intersectional feminists, making angry and funny work. Um, our practices have overlapping features. We want to talk politics. We want to use laughter to break the ice. We want to engage with skill sets, perspectives and personalities beyond our artistic community. Uh, and there's also big differences in how we work in our training and skill sets. So the question was how we might steer an artistic company together. So we began, um, and I think this is a good way to start any, uh, before starting any collaboration, we began by spending a week in Lara's lounge room, thinking about what we needed as individuals, what we could offer each other, what the industry or community or art world might need right now, what was new about this endeavor for us, uh, what this model or collaboration or project might offer the world, what was at risk by jumping into bed together, and whether or not uh, all of these possibilities and conversations excited us. So we're still asking those questions. APHIDS is still an experiment. Uh, the way it works now is that we get paid one day a week each and we also have a uh, operations manager, Beck McCauley, who's a genius, and she keeps an eye on some of the more practical company responsibilities. Beyond that, our income and structure is in flux depending on what projects we're doing. So we looked at other organisations and institutions who have a shared leadership model. We're big fans of SPIN in Belgium and have learnt from lots of shared curatorial models like the one that the IMA had in Brisbane and there's one in Pika in Portland, uh, Pika, I think, anyway. Uh, also, there's like swathes of feminist collectives that uh, influenced us like From Perth the Fondue Set and uh, also our peers like Barbara Cleveland and there was Level in Brisbane. We look at Brisbane. We looked at lots of different organisational models that we might manifest or employ, uh, yeah, employ. So we looked at relaying leadership year by year between the three of us, or we looked at dedicating different roles like finance manager, producer, director. But what we landed on was something that really had plasticity, a model that could stretch and change from, uh, but included us all in all decisions, but that it could hold things like um, rearing children or spending time abroad, something that allowed us to work together on the company and creatively, but also to step out from aphids and work on other projects. So how does it work? There's always been a kind of in-betweenness to the work that aphids has made. It's complicated, but that's one of our strengths. We call it formally promiscuous. But one of the challenges of working in this way is that there is no roadmap. There's no established single methodology for making experimental performance work. And the area of practice is often marginalized or uh, underdocumented, and practitioners tend to move on somewhere around this weird mid career moment that we are in. There are really very few seniors in this area of practice, particularly in this country. So, what we do is, is that as artistic directors, we take turns leading projects we might decide on a direct front direction for a project and then together we'll assign roles as they're needed. So this means that a lot of work comes in figuring out together what is necessary, what's gonna make that project work, and then we have to find resources for that. It's an alchemy of research, strategy, insistence, debate, practicality and obstinance. Um, and how it works in an organisational form is that we have heaps of conversation. Uh, we are in discussion all the time over group chat and um, that, that can really vary through like sending a research link to doing a very detailed budget together. And so we are talking more than the one day a week that we are paid to work, but we're also not putting expectational pressure on each other to be constantly on. There's, um, there's a lot of flexibility. We have a set of commitments that we all believe in. We want to pay people properly. We want to provide a safe, flexible work environment for people of all genders, sexualities, abilities and backgrounds. 
We're committed to allowing for complications of raising kids in the workplace. We can't work when we're hungry, so we need to have a lot of snacks in the workplace. Uh, we trust each other to make decisions when we're not in the room or without consulting with each other constantly. We try to establish best practice and, and lead when we can in terms of making sure that politics are embedded in what we espouse in the practices of our work. So we want to put First Nations knowledge first. We want to um, make sure there's money allocated in our, our budget for these kind of um, consultancies and also a desire to keep working to make space for this uh, knowledge to be present at the forefront of our work. We care for each other as people and we try to remember to constantly talk about our lives outside of the arts. Um, so these are some fundamentals, some are small, some are uh, massive and ongoing in terms of learning. Um, we also like to talk about failure. You might have heard a number of talks about this, but we're going to say it too. It is really hard to fail, but that's what experimentation is about. Um, there's, you know, it's important to push each other, that we keep taking risks. And as collaborators, we want to make sure that there's a responsibility taken to push each other out of our comfort zones and make things that we've never seen before. Um, more fundamentals, bad feelings. Uh, so something that we're always learning together is that collaboration can lead to bad feelings. It's really hard to make art. Um, and hard is sometimes good. Hard can be challenging, provocative, incendiary, but it doesn't come without a cost. It's hard to be honest with each other about touchy, uh, touchy subjects like sexuality, class, race, access, crit criticality. It's hard to reach consensus. Sometimes it's impossible. So we try and make space for bad feelings in the workplace. We make space for bad feelings in the rehearsal studio, the making process, so that when the bad feelings happen, we can deal with the problem or the issue, not the shock of having bad feelings. We align ourselves with feminist thinkers like Sarah Ahmed and Lauren Bland, who position bad feelings as crucial to processes of rupture, disruption, and challenging the status quo. We have strategies for recovery, deep breaths, taking a break, revisiting tense issues the day after, bringing in a dramaturg, um, I find cake helps. Another fundamental for us is that history is useful. So APITS uh, sits in a lineage of experimental art in Australia. We all have our own uh, personal lineages of teachers, mentors, art heroes. The cultural amnesia in Australian arts and culture is chronic and toxic. So we try and constantly remind ourselves of our place in history, of the projects that we've heard about or seen in personal histories. We always invite senior artists into conversation with our work. We actively interrogate our tendency to fetishize what's new, what's young, what's so hot right now. And we ask lots of questions about what came before. We tell stories. We try and remember who taught us certain exercises. Was that Deborah Pollard at Pact or Anne Thompson in North Melbourne? Did we steal this from a talk by Kelly McCluskey? Did we read about that through VNS Matrix or see it in the Kingpins? Who's been here before? What did they do? And what are we doing that's either different or the same or kind of different but kind of the same? Another fundamental is sharing knowledge. Um, so we are really committed to sharing the knowledge that we've gained in our short careers in the arts. We have a program called Supermassive for artists that utilizes our brains as resources and we also try and be as transparent as we can about how the company works. So our, our mentees can come to board meetings or read strategic plans or um, ask us anything really. And another fundamental that we firmly believe is, is that uh, we have to do the work. Sounds obvious, but it's like, you have to do the work. <laughs> it's our job to be prepared. It's our job to revisit debriefs from past projects to allow for learning. It's our job to test every decision artistically for its robustness. We have the privilege in AFEDS of being part of an organisation, so we have to use this privilege to the benefit others and we have to take unpaid labour away from them when we can. Okay, um, so moving into how it works with collaborators outside of AFEDS. Um, we've learned a few tools from being in the room, whether that's the digital room or the physical room. Um, 
having daily check-ins or hourly check-ins or whatever works for you and having a conversation around what the person feels they can offer the project at that time what's on everyone's plates do we need to make time in the working day for things outside of a project like childcare or exercise or other work and how much drive does everyone have right now to offer the project how much energy um, what is the structured day of work for your collaborators? There's this kind of myth that nine to five works for everyone. And I got um, quite, quite excited when I went to Europe and met with Gob Squad, another collective, who and learnt that uh, they start their working day at 11 a.m. So half of the collective can go out and um, go to the nightclub late at night and then finish at 3 p.m. so that people can pick up their kids. Um, the expectations of each other and what's happening in the day ahead. How do they align? How do they differ? Make sure you ask for help. There's no stupid questions and there's the benefit of bringing in someone who's not a key part of a project, someone that might offer uh, time as an outside eye, a consultant, and not have that same investment to allow for questions, feedback and fresh insights. Um, it's good to change it up, try and change environments, go for walks, coffees, beers if you're allowed one day. Um, and making sure that people feel like when they're present, they can be present. So if there is this space where people need to take time out to get something done, then everyone gets that time out to get that thing done and comes back together when they can connect. And transparency, allowing collaborators to access these kind of documents and things that have come before and be able to understand and weigh in on the broad kind of scheduling resources budgets timelines if they desire it's not putting that work on them but making sure that that knowledge is available so to maintain this plasticity this in between we change the models of our creative and organizational structures we try to open them, have them ever evolving and ask for feedback on them. We try to reflect on what worked and what didn't for next time. So I guess um, we're always reconsidering our fundamentals and applying them to any particular set of circumstances. So one example is Exit Strategies, which was a show we did last year. Um, I was the lead artist on that, writing and directing. Lara came in to run the rehearsal room and be a guide for the creatives and Eugenia was in charge of design, costume and set and she worked with um, Zoe Scolio, our video designer. On top of that we brought in a whole bunch of collaborators with specific skills and we, of course the three of us all worked across all areas and blurred those uh, definitions and we, read it, we were led together an all female team. Um, so that's one set of circumstances. Another is a board meeting. So if we're preparing for a board meeting, uh, Lara might work with Beck, our operations manager, to prepare documents and send out invitations. I might prep the catering and organise the venue, making sure there's lots of extra cheese. And then uh, Eugenia might write the AD report. We try and respond to each situation with a new structure according to what's needed, what we have and where we want to be. Um. Another uh, sort of thing we've learned is that it's good to kind of have a check in around what the power is in the comp uh, in the collaboration. I think it's uh, fine for us to sort of espouse kind of anti hierarchical or sort of loose um, kind of roles in a collaboration. But uh, it's also important to acknowledge that power comes in lots of visible and invisible forms. So there is the power of roles and crediting. Is this predetermined or evolving? Um, can you acknowledge with your collaborators who is getting credited for what? And is that something that can shift? Uh, the power of running the room or bringing ideas to the table. It's good to talk about who, who got us here. What are we expecting of them? Do they want to lead or is that just something that we're assuming of them? Are we going to structure the day together and um, decide that as a consensus at the beginning of the day? Um, how attached are we to the ideas that we've brought to the table? What is the labour and investment already undertaken and has that been valued? 
um, for example, being the, uh, the power of being the fundraiser? What did it take to get here? And um, is that person assumed to continue fundraising for the project? Is that an invisible form of labour? Uh, the power of taking on that administrative labour, of that scheduling, of booking that room, who's done that and have they been valued? Would it have been better if it was shared? Uh, the power of having no administrative labour, who had the freedom to just turn up? Uh, the power of experience, who's been here before and understands these processes, these words, these um, forms, who might be left behind? Um, power of connections and being on trend, who's expected to bring networks and connections to this project? Uh, the power of having time, who has the time beyond this room to dig deeper into the ideas and form and who completely just has to switch off or even leave 10 minutes early. Um, power of privilege and education and class and all of those things, you know, are we using inaccessible language? Do we make room to ask questions? Uh, do we have space to have different paces and processes? Um, the power of authenticity. Are we expecting someone to leave because they have lived experience of the subject matter? Can all of this be transparent? Can people talk to their understanding and expectations of a project at the beginnings and keep checking in throughout a process? So because we have a level of steadiness not afforded to most independent artists, and um, it feels kind of ridiculous to say that because we work one day a week, um, but it is steadiness and we really appreciate it. We're very grateful but we try and use that steadiness to place our thinking and action into a bigger picture. So we allocate time to zoom out, to reflect on the industry, how we might advocate change or create trouble or help out those who need it. It's part of us trying to manifest our politics. We want to be a company that does our politics as well as doing our political art. So that might mean taking time for mentoring or hosting other artists or writing bolshy letters to institutions or sharing a budget. Um, but we believe that we're part of a bigger collaboration and that is the way that we work within the ecosystem of art making. And occasionally what we'll do is spend time thinking through alternative models for that ecosystem. So questioning its, uh, uh, the sol solid nature of it or the possibilities for plasticity within the ecosystem. So we have an example. Um, we thought it might be good to just touch on quickly uh, the relationships and collaborative possibilities with people that aren't sort of artists, so relationships and collaborations with pre presenters and stakeholders. Um, could that be more collaborative? Who sets the guidelines for these relationships? Can there be more transparency? Um, artists are consistently pitching or applying to presenters and stakeholders. Could that have some rebalance in the relationship? Even if it's the small things, like if you are waged, can you go and have a meeting where the artist works rather than expect us to come to you when we are not getting paid for that? Could a presenter or stakeholder pitch back to artists about their interest in our practice instead of us uh, not knowing how you see us or how you understand our work. Could there be transparencies of working documents and budgets so we know what your expected investment is and what the overall considerations and costs and risks are so we can be on board with making sure that works out for everyone. Um, if presenters need or, or stakeholders need to tick certain boxes, don't hide that. Tell us. We want to know, you know, if you need to make a certain amount of money, if you have to attract a certain kind of audience, because this helps us to work out if there is this synergy and if we are the right fit for you. And um, could both sides present case studies? Like what relationships have you had in the past? What worked? What didn't work? Because... Um, they're never perfect sort of scenarios from a relationship and it's really great to not make the same mistakes but keep learning from these experiences and evolve our relationships together. So as you can see, we spend a lot of time asking questions, talking a lot and nutting things out together and we would recommend that process to anyone even though it's challenging. So any kind of rethinking of collaboration in this new context is going to require a lot of that interrogation and work. For aphids, we're always thinking about power, the power that we have, the power that we encounter. We're 
committed to plasticity as the governing principle of effective collaboration. We're always actively seeking out new ways of working with each other, with our invited others and with our industry. We push each other, but we resist the capitalist urge to dehumanise. We instead apply a politics of care to each other, to our extended family of collaborators and to our industry. We're really proud of the kind of shape shifter organisation that APHIDS is and the way that it can hold us as we try and respond to a multifarious and ever evolving set of conditions and contexts and, and as we kind of make work together. That's all, thank you. Thanks everyone. Oh, just bringing up my slides now. Thank you so much, um, Lara and Mish. That was amazing. Like, I think it gave us more questions than answers necessarily, but I think that's always a good thing. Um, and we've had quite a lot of questions come in throughout. So I think we'll just jump straight into them because we've got another 10 minutes or so. So please keep sending any questions through to the Q&A and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, you can also vote to bump these questions up as well, everyone in the audience. So if you have see a particular question there you want answered, um, just give it a like. So first up, um, we have a question from Josephine Mead who asks, can you please define the term cultural amnesia? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have a technical definition, but the way that I think about it is just that um, the histories, certainly within the history of experimental practice or experimental performance practice in Australia, the um, recent histories of practices are not necessarily alive in uh, current practice. So I just think that we forget about artists who've come before or generations who've come before. I think that's reflected in the way that we're educated. So often people will know more about a certain history um, you know, like of European art, like, or we might, we might know more about forced entertainment, for example, than we do about Sydney front, if, and that's a very specific thing to my kind of industry, but I think it, uh, to my like particular area of practice, I mean, but I think it's true that we are just um, somehow more, more well-versed and our reference points tend to be overseas. And that's part of a kind of cultural cringe that we are trying to actively undo with our practice. Um, but yeah, I, that's what I mean. I hope that makes sense. Great, thank you. Um, next up, we've got a question from Karen, who asks, what digital collaborative work platforms or tools do you use? Uh, I'd say we're pretty uninnovative, uninnovative, uninnovative there. Um, we use WhatsApp and we use Google Hangouts. So there you go. And Trello? Trello. Trello is a good one because it's very clear at putting um, kind of to do cre creative um, things and organizational things sort of next to each other. But I think oh. the key with those uh, platforms is follow through. Like I feel like any of them can work, but it's like, uh, it's like so many things. It's like you've got to have that discipline of everyone committing and following through. And I say that as the person who took the longest within the APHIDS organisation <laughs> to have that follow through with, with Trello is that like it really has to become part of the practice and you have to like we have to commit to making sure that we go into the Trello before we have our weekly day together and look at what's uh, what's on the to-do list, what's in the on the like in progress list and what's being ticked off and like have that familiarity it's like just, it's what, that's that kind of fundamental of like, it's our job to do the work. You have to have that commitment. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Um, this one's got eight likes, so lots of people interested to hear how you settle creative differences. Great question. Um, I think if it's getting to a point where it, it's not sort of getting resolved, we might come back to it the next day and, um, being able to have that space to um, let the ideas kind of shift often works and you sort of can kind of come down from pushing an idea or come up to someone else's idea or we just try it. If it's possible, we try it out and see if it works. Um, there's also, uh, you know, the possibility of bringing in an outside eye or maybe there's someone else in the room that's not weighing in that can add their point of view, but it's an ever evolving process. I mean, the example Mish gave, gave of working on exit strategies, that wasn't necessarily us setting up a project um, 
exactly in the best possible model we could imagine. It was a kind of combination of many different factors and there was a lot of learning through coming together for that project. But I think what we're trying to um, get better at as well is like a chain of command. So like the idea that um, the uh, it's that there's no director doesn't mean that there's no chain of command like who has the final say I think someone can have the final say and that still has there's an integrity to that as long as we agree so like for example with how uh, another project that we did this year at the Art Gallery of South Australia um, I'm leading the room in how but um, Lara and Willow and Liz who made the project together which is before uh, this is a, a historical aphids project they have the final say so we make sure that everyone knows that so sometimes it's like uh, uh, so I get asked a question by the lighting designer and I, I don't know the answer so we have to stop processes and I have to turn to the performers and we debate it out together and I check in with what they want and then I can funnel that back in so we sort of understand that it's um, time consuming and we all agree to that and we all agree to like where the buck stops if that makes sense but I mean, like, ultimately, yeah, there is no magic formula to make you agree, is there? Like, sometimes you just firmly feel differently about things and you just have to keep um, working it out by doing the work together. So by not, like, imagining it and thinking which one will be best, but actually doing it so that you can maybe learn more about who's right or who's wrong. <laughs> um, and or, or, or just compromise. Compromise is our business. Yeah, great advice. Thank you. We've probably got time for maybe two more, two or three more questions. So this one's from Elaine. She asks, have you considered bringing on new partners and growing the collaboration bigger? Uh, if not, why? And what is the optimum number of partners for a collaboration for your organisation? Um, we are, I guess, constantly looking for new partners and new collaborators. Um, not necessarily as co-artistic directors of the organisation because as three CEOs and three artistic directors, there's sort of a lot of time spent um, in conversation already and we don't feel like we need to kind of open that up after a year together yet. Um, that said, you know, we bring in people into the company through the Supermassive program and that is um, about sort of skilling up predominantly um, female identifying artists to um, help them creatively with their ideas and also with, um, you know, any kind of company management skills they are looking for. Uh, in terms of like project to project, we will always be working with people with different skill sets, different knowledge bases, different research. Um, the last project we did, we probably worked with uh, two people that we knew of already and had worked with in previous projects and a couple of people that we've never worked with before and we will probably work with again. Uh, when we went to Adelaide, we worked with uh, seven local performers, a local sound artist um, and several local crew that we will uh, sort of never had the chance to meet before. So our collaborative processes are constantly shifting and um, new models are constantly on the horizon. Great. And I think we'll just tie it up with this la one last question, which is from Raina, um, who asks, do you have any collaboration tips for introverts? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Emailing, perhaps? Um, there's been sort of several times like we think debriefing and getting feedback on projects is super important and so there's been several times I've been like does anyone have feedback with how that went and they'll be quiet in the room and they'll say okay please feel free to email and that's when you'll get the sort of most important uh, feedback on on sort of what you could have done better and that is super valuable I mean uh, if you you know if you see that there's a collaboration that could use something else. I think it's always really good to be able to feed that back. You just have to choose the right time and um, take it slowly. Like there's sort of this rush sometimes I think with collaboration that you have to make something immediately or you have to um, have a super specific goal in mind but being able to collaborate first as people and as friends um, 
however methods you can use that, I think is, is really great and useful as well. I think also, yeah, that thing of like being humans and being friends, like, um, I think that's something that we try and acknowledge as we outlined in our talk, like, is that um, people have different needs. And if you can try and figure out what your own needs are for any collaboration, then you're going to be able to better communicate that. And then if you respect other people's needs and, and try and give them what you can within the, the realm of possibilities and uh, agreements, <laughs> then everyone feels like they can be themselves, you know? Like, it's kind of like, like we say, like, what is it to get into bed together? It's like, we're in a relationship together. We're, we're definitely in like a hardcore three way. So it's like a lot of communication, <laughs> a lot of time and a lot of like honesty. <laughs> Um, a way to wrap up, Laura. Did you have anything <laughs> else to, to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say I can see the questions that um, we haven't had time to answer, and just wanted to invite those um, people to email us. You can find it on our website, afids.net, because there's some great questions there that I'd be really happy to have a conversation with you about. Um, and just to say thanks for. Um, joining us. It was an experiment for us to collaborate in making this presentation as well. So we appreciate all of your um, thoughts and uh, ideas. Yeah, in true collaborative fashion, you just took the words out of my mouth. I was about to say, yeah, absolutely. There's been so many great questions and um, please send them through directly to um, Lara and Mish or you can send them to the leadership inbox and we can pass them on as well. Um, great, so thank you so much. Um, just a reminder before we wrap up, um, as mentioned last week, we'll be launching some new webinars shortly um, for you to sign up to. These have been curated with the ever-changing times in mind and will remain on Wednesdays and Fridays without any clashes with other webinars that are going on. Um, please keep an eye out on our website for these new webinars shortly. Um, we'll start this Friday with one of the new ones, which is actually, we'll be hearing from Zach Del Amelia, the strategic partner um, manager for Australia, New Zealand, Instagram. Um, he'll be talking about how you can build your brand online on Instagram. And then on Wednesday next week, we'll actually be hosting two sessions, one at 11 a.m. with Facebook about growing and engaging your audience. And then again at 3 p.m. with Dr. Tristan Schultz, which I think has like an incredible sign up already. He's an expert in facilitating workshops and experiences, um, and he's talking about how to do this online. So please join us if you haven't already. Thanks again for joining us today. Uh, thanks to Mish, to Lara, to our amazing Auslan interpreters, David and Chavoy, to our live captioner, and of course our wonderful team that's working behind the scenes, Laura, Kevin and Ian. And of course to all of you, thank you so much for being here and we hope to see you next time. Okay, bye for now. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank bye. you.